So I want to finish off chapter six by talking about a really important material property called hardness. So hardness is defined as a measure of materials resistance to plastic deformation. Um, increasing the hardness of a material is really important for a lot of applications in materials engineering. As you can imagine, there's plenty of devices out there that you don't want to plastically deform under use. And there's a lot of different methods to do this, and we're going to talk about a lot of these methods um, in upcoming chapters. Um, but one way is work hardening, where you actually strain a material past its yield point because materials get harder as they're abused. So here's a couple of pictures um, showing uh, two different examples of work hardening. So one example shown here is just simply rolling it out. So you have a sheet of metal and then you push it between two rollers and mash it into a thinner sheet. And that's one way to um, apply work to the, to the object and cause it to harden. And then this one on the um, right is shot painting where they actually shoot small balls of metal at really high speeds at the material, causing it to be beaten out, okay? Um, and that is another way of work hardening the material. Now, of course, a tensile, a tensile strength test can also um, cause work hardening. In the last lecture, we talked about plots of true stress versus true strain. So if you take an engineering stress strain curve where it comes up and then goes back down and then correct um, to divide by the actual cross-sectional area um, and figure out what the true stress and the true strain on the material is, then for a lot of materials, you can see that the true stress versus true strain curve actually goes up up over time. It has a positive slope as um, you increase your load. And that is a sign of hardening. And the higher the slope as it goes out, the larger the hardening of the material. And you can see an increase in the yield strength of the material as it's plastically deformed if you look at these true stress versus true strain plots. One way to quantify this is to perform this curve fit to this true stress, true strain plot. It obeys the equation oftentimes. Sigma sub t, your true stress, is equal to k, some constant that comes from the fit, times your true strain to the power of n. And n here is called the hardening exponent. And some typical values for N are about 0.15 for some steels or 0.5 for some coppers. Of course, if you take a material and you apply a tensile um, stress to it, it'll go up. And then after a while, if you don't take it all the way to fracture, if you then release and let it go back down, then what will happen is you'll get some recovery of that material in the elastic regime. So here's what happened. I applied the load to the material. Here's the elastic regime. Then it begins to plastically deform. But then at that time, I release the load, okay? As I release the load, I can watch what happens to the strain, and it will recover to a certain amount. That amount that it recovers is the elastic strain recovery. But then if I were to reapply the load, I would see an elastic regime once more, and then it would go up and kind of continue on its way on that true stress versus true strain plot. Okay, here's an example problem for you. Um, the following true stresses produce the corresponding true strains for a brass alloy. So if you apply a true stress in terms of pounds per square inch of 50,000 PSI, then you get a true strain of 0.1. Or 60,000 PSI results in a true strain of 0.2. So what true stress is necessary to produce a true plastic strain of 0.25? Okay, so the solution to that is to use the equation defined on the uh, beginning or earlier slide. Sigma sub t is equal to k epsilon to the nth, okay? Now what we're going to do is because this k is kind of a fit constant, you actually have to have data in order to solve for it and plug it back in. So you have here, you have two unknowns that depend upon the material and you weren't given the unknown, those unknowns. And those unknowns are k and n, your exponent, okay? So what we have to do is take the data that we were given, the 50,000 and 60,000 PSI and the resulting true strain 0.1 and 0.2, and then use those to solve for our unknowns, which are the k and the n values.
So to do that, I've taken the equations and I've plugged in the two values, two sets of values that we have, and then I'm going to subtract those two equations. So if I take the natural log of both sides, then this becomes mathematically much easier to do. So then I have the natural log of my true stress is equal to the natural log of K plus N natural log of my strain. Now if I plug in my values and subtract them, uh, subtract the two equations with the values in there, then the k, the ln of k, that subtracts out and I don't have to solve for that. Then I can um, only have one unknown, which is my value for n. So if I subtract ln of 60,000 equals ln of k plus n log of 2, and I subtract from that ln of 50,000 equals ln of k plus n log of 0.1, then my k's cancel out, they subtract out, I end up with natural log of 60,000 minus the natural log of 50,000 equals n times the natural log of uh, 2.2 minus the natural log of 0.1. Then if I rearrange that equation and divide both sides by the subtraction of these natural logs, I can solve for n, and I get n is equal to 0 0.263, okay? So now that I have my exponent n, I can plug that back into one of the two equations that I have for my data. I chose the 50,000 PSI one. So then I have 50,000 PSI is equal to k times 0 0.1 to the 0 0.263 power, and then I can solve for k, and I get k is 91,620 psi. Now that I have my two unknown constants, I can plug those in um, for the strain that was asked for in the problem, 0 0.25, and I can solve for the true stress that is needed to produce that true strain. And when I do that, I get 63,630 um, psi. Okay? All right. Now, of course, tensile stress um, is not the only way to measure the hardness of the material. There's um, hardness testing machines that are out there. Um, it's really cheap. It's really easy to do these tests um, compared to many other materials tests. So hardness tests are very common to do on materials. Now, most hardness testing machines out there, what they do is they measure the resistance to an indentation of the surface. Of course, a large hardness means that it resists plastic deformation or cracking and it has better wear properties, um, and which would mean that if you take a, uh, an indenter of some geometry and push it really hard into the surface, that the material doesn't indent as easily. In other words, it leaves a smaller mark in the material when you push with the same force if the material is harder. Um, of course, if you plot increasing hardness as measured, you're going to start off with plastics being really low. Aluminum is kind of a soft metal, so it'll be better than the plastics, but compared to other metals, maybe not so great. Then you're going to have your steels of varying strength, okay, all the way up to these nitrided steels, which are super hard. But of course, diamond is one of the hardest materials um, known to man, so it'll be up here on the upper part of the scale. Now, there's a whole bunch of different hardness testing machines out there, and which one you choose might depend upon what kind of material that you're working with. If you want to know the hardness of softer materials like polymers or plastics, you might choose a different machine than if you want to test the hardness of some really hard nitrided steels, for example. Um, also, it depends a little bit on the length scale that you're worried about the hardness on. The indenters have different shapes and sizes, and so if you're um, worried about where and hardness on a large scale, you might choose a different indenter than if you're worried about it on a very small scale. So here's some of the um, hardness testers out there. There's the Brunel test, which uses a 10 millimeter sphere of steel as the indenter. Um, and then you can get your hardness out of it this way. You've got your Vickers micro hardness test, which uses a diamond pyramid, which has a very different shape to it. You've got your Noop micro hardness test, which also uses a diamond pyramid, but the shape of the pyramid is different from the Vickers test. And you've got your Rockwell and your superficial Rockwell, which uses these spheres or diamond cones and um, applies different uh, levels of hardness test there. So there's all kinds of different hardness testers, and which one that you're interested in um, really depends upon what your application is for your, uh, for your material. So the Rockwell test, um, you don't really do any major sample damage, and your scale runs to 130, but it's usually only useful in the range of 20 to 100 hardness. The minor loads are 10 kilograms, um, so basically 10 kilograms times G, and your major loads are much higher than that.
Um, you can also, from your Brunel hardness test, get a direct extraction of what the tensile strength of the material is. So that's very useful. If you want to do a conversion, you can get your tensile strength in um, pounds per square inch by multiplying 500 times what you get for your Brunel hardness and your tensile strength in megapascals by multiplying 3.45 times your Brunel hardness. So a lot of people like the Brunel test because you can directly extract the tensile strength in that way. But no matter what kind of test you use, your hardness is directly related to the tensile strength. This shouldn't be very surprising given that we saw the hardness of materials increase as they were subjected to tensile strength tests. That makes sense. And of course, if you, um, if you work a material, then the yield strength is going to increase on the material. So there's this relationship, of course, between hardness and tensile strength that is pretty straightforward to understand. What's not so straightforward to understand is how these hardness scales overlap, okay? So if you were interested in geology and had a rock collection when you were a kid like I did, um, then you might remember the Mohs scale of hardness. The Mohs scale of hardness goes from 1 to 10, and talc was down there at the very bottom with a Mohs hardness of 1, and diamond was up um, at the very tip top with a, with a value of 10. And what you did was, um, if you wanted to test something, you would just scratch stuff right? So you would take something that was higher on the hardness scale and try to scratch something. And then if it scratched it, then that meant that it was uh, the hardness of the unknown material was less than what you had. And if it didn't scratch it, um, then it was higher. Okay, so that was kind of a, a rock hounds version of hardness. All right. But of course, we've gotten a lot more quantitative with it in material science with all those hardness testing um, machines. How the hardness testing machines basically work is they take one of the those testers, they apply a known load or force to the sample, and then you lift out. And then you image the indent that was made in the material, okay? You measure how big the cross-sectional area of the indent is for that material, and then you use that to calculate your hardness value. So that's basically how most hardness tests work. And we'll do one in lab, okay? Um, but because all the tips and all the indenters have different geometries and they work in different load regimes and they're good for different kinds of tests and materials, they don't really overlap in a nice systematic way as you can see here. So here's your Mohs scale of hardness and it kind of shows how um, most materials relate here, plastics down on the bottom, nitride and steels down, uh, right here, diamond of course way up here at the top. And then if you look at the various scales, there's the Rockwell C, the Rockwell B, the Brunel, and the Noop, and you can see that there's really no straightforward way to convert from one hardness scale to another hardness scale. They give nice systematic results within their own test, right? And you can kind of predict how things are going to fall within their own tests, but um, it's kind of difficult to say, use a new hardness tester and then be able to say exactly what the Rockwell C hardness test would predict. It's, it's not quite so easy, okay? There's not been a comprehensive conversion scheme that's been devised because it's not a super well-defined material property. But there's tables, so if you want to look it up, you can kind of figure out and estimate what it would be on one scale to another, but it's not so straightforward, okay? So I guess the take-home message for future materials scientists and engineers is reproduce, 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 take a lot of data, take a lot of data, take a lot of data if it's important, okay? All right. Now, like I said, the, um, the Brunel hardness test is a really useful hardness test because there is kind of that direct conversion that you can use to estimate the tensile strength from the results that you get from a Brunel hardness test and vice versa. If you know the tensile strength, you can estimate the Brunel hardness. So for an example of that, let's look here. Here's a material who's um, been subjected to a stress strain curve, a stress strain plot in a tensile strength tester, and you get this plot of the engineering stress versus strain. Now, from the tensile strength, which of course is the maximum on this engineering stress strain curve, you can use that to estimate what your Brunel hardness is. All right, so here the tensile strength for this material was measured as 450 megapascals. Now using the equation I showed you on the previous slide, the tensile strength is equal to 3.45 times the Brunel hardness when you're working in megapascals. So here we have 
450 megapascals is equal to 3.45 times the Brunel hardness, which, keeping two sig figs, gives you a Brunel hardness of 130. Now, it's not so straightforward to go from one hardness scale to another hardness scale, but you could use this to estimate the Rockwell hardness just by looking at this little plot. So if you go to about 130 for your Brunel hardness, this is about right here on this um, scale. And so then if I go over and look at the other plot, I might estimate, say, 60 or 70 for a Rockwell hardness um, for that material. Okay, so that's kind of how you would do it. Now, when you do any kind of testing um, of materials, and it's important for material science or materials engineering application, you're trying to design a good part that won't fail, you're trying to make sure that people are safe when you um, put products out there on the market, especially for things like cars and bridges, you can imagine that um, elevators, goodness gracious, you want to make sure that um, you're designing a part that has um, the specifications that will keep people safe. So what you have to do as a material scientist or engineer is do a lot of tests because there's going to be variability in the results of each test. Um, all these properties are going to depend very largely on sample flaws and defects and how they were processed. And so you're not going to be able to, say, measure a tensile strength of 450 megapascals and say, this is it for this part, and it'll be the same no matter where you are on the part, and it'll be the same for every single part we put out. It's not like that. So what you have to do is you have to conduct a lot of tests, okay? And then you want to generate your mean and your standard deviation for what your hardness or your tensile strength or your yield strength of that material is. You want to make sure that you do that to make people safe, okay? So all that stuff that we learned in our statistical analysis um, in uh, undergraduate is really, really useful here. You need to calculate your mean uh, tensile strength, for example, and then you need to have a standard deviation for that tensile strength. Now that's not enough, okay? Engineers will oftentimes put in what's called a factor of safety or a safety factor into that value when it's important, okay? Because, remember, your uh, Gaussian distribution is a very wide curve. Let's say that you've got an elevator cable, right, and you have produced 200,000 elevator cables in a year. Well, statistically speaking, there will be an elevator cable that has a very, very low yield strength compared to all the other elevator cables just because that's how statistics work, okay? And so what you want to do is once you've calculated your mean and your standard deviation, you don't want to just rely on that. You want to put in a factor of safety so that you do not push the limits at all to make sure that people are safe. So what you do is, if you know that you're going to be working in a certain regime, if you know what a threshold yield strength you need for your material is, then you take that value and you put in a factor of safety of, say, 1.2 to 4 or 5 or whatever, so that you keep those people as safe as possible. And you want your working yield strength to be much less than what your final yield strength for the part is going to be. So as an example of that, let's figure out a diameter D to ensure that yield doesn't occur in this carbon steel rod below, okay? We're going to use a factor of safety of 5. So let's say that you know that this carbon steel rod is going to regularly undergo a, a pulling force of 220,000 newtons, okay? And you want to make sure that nothing happens to the folks that are relying on that part to work. Okay, so your working stress then would be 220,000 newtons divided by pi r squared. Now, we measure the diameter here, so r is equal to d over 2, and then you square that. So what you've got here in the bottom to calculate your yield stress is pi times d squared over 4, and that'll be your working value, okay? Now, you know what the yield strength is for your 1045 carbon steel rod. It's actually, if you look it up in the tables, 310 megapascals, okay? But you don't, you don't want that part to yield at all, and you want to be able to account for problems with processing and flaws in the material. And so you're going to put in a safety factor of 5 and divide by that, and then keep your working stress at that threshold level. You, you really don't want to push it. So that means that you're going to need a fatter rod than you might have need if you were going to push that value, okay?
So then when you calculate, you do a little uh, simple algebra and you solve for D and you get a threshold value for your diameter of 6.7 centimeters. Okay. All right. Um, I hope that's uh, easy to understand and straightforward. Um, but if not, you can always ask me questions. I welcome them and uh, I'll see you later.